Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to the CMask podcast. I am joined with Will and Tim. Mr. Mike Pantile is getting his marriage convalidated, so shoot up some smoke for uh, Mike. He's been a real example of a lot of aspects of coming back to the faith, but I know this is a big day for him and his wife, so say a prayer for him. And today we are going to be discussing uh, the five most common or most perfidious misconceptions about patriarchy. Um, as Tim and I are finishing this movie and Tim is finishing his book, Leave and Cleave, and Will is saving the most ext extreme circumstances of marriage peril that I've ever heard. We run into these things a lot and uh, patriarchy has been sort of a pejorative for a long time, sort of like uh, misogynist or toxic masculinity. It's just, uh, it's basically a four letter word and, and we're reclaiming it. We are, in my opinion, on the precipice of the next five years looking very different than the previous 60-ish years with respect to the concept of patriarchy. And uh, you're hearing a lot of it here first on the C-Mask show. So, Will, how are you doing this morning? Doing really well, Nick. Good to see you guys again. And this is a big one. This is so important. Misconceptions about patriarchy has been given a bad name. Totally. Totally. Tim, you doing well? Quite well. Thank you. Good. Though patriarchy is not. As of okay. right now, we're turning it around. We are. We're going to steer the ship around. Well, um, I'm going to get started as the non-patriarch um, because this is something that uh, talking with you guys over the last several months has um, enlightened me about. And then we'll move on to the two that you guys brought forward. And the the way I can summarize my perspective in, in the, the shift was the phrase before kids. I kept thinking about this time, quote unquote, before kids as a time wherein you have <clears throat> the last vestiges of self-actualization as a man or as a couple with your new wife, that this is the time when you X, when you get to achieve or explore, um, you know, go to Europe or um, do an RV trip or write the book, um, whatever it is, that it's prior to kids that you can become the type of man that you want to be. And then dang it, once kids come along, that's it. Your life's over. You have to shift from doing the thing that you wanted to do, the thing that actualized you as a man, to now you have this bonded indemniture, this indentured servitude for the rest of your life of being a father. Um, so Tim... Uh, I kind of reference two things that you sort of do a lot, which is RVing and riding, among many other things, playing basketball, um, just hanging out with friends. You're sort of the living repudiation to this notion. notion. Uh, what's your what's your take on this concept of before kids? It's a tawdry boomerism, like so much else that goes for wisdom in our day, and, but it's dying out as wisdom and no longer being able to be passed off so convincingly as wisdom. This is not true. I mean, <clears throat> we were talking the other night uh, about the, I don't know, I don't want to sound like I'm all against it, but the medicalization of births, treating, treating a woman being pregnant as if she's sick. And it is um, in, in many ways a natural process. Uh, you and I were talking about this with Isabel and Steph, and um, I would say that 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 misconception in our once wasp, now just outright secular left culture, has extended beyond uh, you know in, into the postpartum years, such that kids are just sort of considered a sickness, and and this comes from like you know UNICEF, One World, the Gates Foundation, Malthus, sort of yeah. Types. Yeah, um, humans are a plague. If you watch any of the animal shows on Discovery or whatever, whatever channel, they, they're, they're all that humans are the plague. Whales are really good. Snakes are good. You watch Shark Week. 
sharks are actually really good. They make them all say that, hey, if you, you know, good interview about the shark eating your leg. Um, but we're not going to run it unless you say, I don't blame the shark. They all fucking say that nonsense. <laughs> it's because humans are bad. That's the fundamental point of view. And they blame young humans more than adult humans. And they blame pregnant women. So the long and the short of it is it's not sick. It's natural. It's um, like anything that's anti-boomerism. Things just work if you're not gay and like, over planning about them just you're meant to sex is between a, a man and a woman who love each other very natural you're not supposed to plan out your kids even if you're you know kind of practicing what what's called what's the the, the misnomer of nfp which really isn't a thing um moral or immoral it's just yeah you, you can have sex on on probably infertile days of the month even you're planning that and you just, you end up having a kid um, most of the time, unless you're really like lame and, and um, anal retentive about it. And that's, that's precisely why it's allowed. You just sort of get pregnant as a patriarchal household extemporaneously. And the pregnancy should proceed somewhat extemporaneously. And then the baby is born and you're, you're meant to, we, we talk about this in our new book, leave and cleave. You're meant to, parent according to your you know the, the, the way that the household operates which is partly extemporaneously aside from the christian principles um not really much else is fixed the, the christian principles are what tether you to ontology and tether you to god tether you to being but this means that if you i think if you're doing it right all households run differently but yeah there's plenty of time for other stuff even if you have a big bustling household. I wish mine was bigger and more bustling um, than just having seven kids. But it, it's just a, a sad, originally wasp, currently secular left, uh, false platitude. You know, it's a mendacity to say that if you have a lot of people around, it's not a party. It's, it's more of a party with a lot of people around. That's, that's the answer. Will, when you became a dad, did you be did you have to jettison your hopes and dreams and your actualization, or did you become who you are? So I had three kids under age three by the time I was 23. So there really wasn't any like much difference between me being like a kid or teenager and then just having kids. Right. So the idea of this big, important, phase of life that's so deeply meaningful before kids is just not something that was ever on my radar like to me that just sounds like someone is being a kid themselves it's something you do when you're like i don't know age 12 to sort of 18 19 ish around that like that's the before kids area historically most people were married by the time they're around early 20s with kids and they're not using contraception so the idea that there's this long stretch of time after marriage, but before kids, it's weird. That's not how people lived. And before contraception, the average number of kids was seven. Like this is just normal. And it shouldn't be a surprise when women get pregnant. I was a Nietzschean before I was Christian. And as much as he gets wrong, there's also plenty he gets right. And one of the things he gets right is this. Everything about women is a mystery, and the mystery has one answer, pregnancy, okay? <laughs> and we can give more precision to that than he has done. We can talk about it in Aristotomist language and say that the essence of womanhood is the potential for motherhood, right? That's what he's saying there, but in his edgy, creative writing teen style rather than as Aristotle or Aquinas would phrase it, the same goes for men. Like I think that fatherhood fundamentally is what unlocks what manhood really is. Like that's what men are aimed at. The potential for motherhood is the essence of womanhood. The potential for fatherhood is the essence of manhood. So of course, your wife having kids, you having kids, isn't some kind of sideshow that's a distraction from the rest of your life. If you're called to marriage and Procreation 
is the main point of marriage as a natural institution, this is it. This is the main thing. Everything else is the sideshow. Yeah, and the woman is a mother in potency, man is a father in potency thing is, I think, was the last piece of the puzzle that clicked for me where I realized that to really know your romantic partner, it's not going to be through any experience of an activity or like a life event. It's not going to like her grandfather's funeral or like your 27th birthday party or going to England or something like that. No offense. Well, I really enjoyed England. Um, it's, it's, both of you becoming parents and then that's when you actually get to know who they are in actuality and when that clicked for me i was like oh my goodness okay so this whole before kids thing is is like very high school boyfriend girlfriend mentality um you know it's very sophomoric and when you look to 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 build on what tim was saying if you look to Casty kanubi there's i was i was realizing this that if in the Council of Trent, uh, Catechism of Trent, it says that there's basically no instance where a Eucharistic minister is valid. The language is extremely clear that you you would need like 300,000 people showing up to your local parish for Sunday Mass unexpectedly for you to have like Eucharistic ministers. And now they're at every single Sunday Mass. And the same thing sort of happened with this this NFP mindset, I think. And if you read Casti Kanubi, it's very clear that, that you should be doing it's a it's like disordered to do anything to frustrate the the natural end. The word is frustrate, which I thought was an interesting thing. That to frustrate the natural end of marriage, which is children. Like that's what you're there for. So if your head and heart and logistics are kind of conspiring against that, like you're just very confused about the nature of marriage. You're just trying to date. This is a fornicative, uh, contraceptive mentality, basically. Um, and so the career of the guy is not what actualizes him. It's not him becoming a a billionaire or a real estate agent or anything like that. It's it's virtuous patriarchy, which gets into, Will, your first misconception, our number two on the list here, which is billionaire patriarch. What is a billionaire patriarch? So what's our name for misconception one, Nick? Have we got a cool name for number one? Uh, bef before kids <laughs> or maybe dink <laughs> you know dink uh double income no kids dink is, patriarchy is, yeah i love it yeah, yep. dink patriarchy okay so from dink patriarchy to billionaire patriarchy let me read this out first this is an example of the guy who is suffering from having pursued billionaire patriarchy okay listen carefully there are so many guys in this situation it's a bad one to be in too over the 16 years of marriage I have acquiesced to my wife a lot in order to keep the peace. <laughs> she could make life miserable. So I got to the point where there was no battle worth fighting. Now I realize that even though I'm a great husband and provide a great life for her, she doesn't respect me. And in turn, she is also not affectionate with me. I was ready to divorce. But I think before I do that, I want to step into the leadership role and see if that changes anything. I'm a natural leader, a business owner. I get respect everywhere, but from my wife. That needs to change. Now, this is so interesting because the guy sees himself as a great husband because he provides a great life for her. Think about that. I'm a great husband. I provide a great life for her. Thing is, though, that no matter how much money you earn, and this is the billionaire patriarch's misconception, no matter how good you might be as a material provider, maybe you can buy her a Lambo for Valentine's Day. Like you see some of these really successful entrepreneurs on social media actually do. Like, hey, honey, here's your Lambo. Here's your Ferrari for Valentine's Day. And by the way, you can have another one for Christmas, too. Um, they can just make it rain like that the whole time. But the more important thing you have to do is actually provide for her 
morally, spiritually. You have to provide that actual framework within which she's living so that she discharges all her duties as a wife and as a mother faithfully. And you can have as much money as you want, but fail in the most important areas. It's much better to have a very modest material standard of living, but have a wife who actually respects you. And you're being the man who establishes the moral boundaries and providing than it is just to be able to splash cash. But we've been told as modern men for decades and decades now that money is the main metric for measuring masculinity. Problem with that is that Kim Kardashian out earns 99.999% of men worldwide. Does that mean that she is more of a man than they are? Like if money becomes the main measure of what makes a man a man, you get problems for single men and also for married men too. And you can make your marriage worse by pursuing more and more money. The risk of divorce goes down, 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 up to 200K household income. Then it flatlines, nothing happens, okay? Mm. At 600K household income, it goes up. Divorce starts to go up again. <laughs> Because the amount of sacrifice a guy has to make, the way he has to prioritize his business affairs to hit and then maintain that level of household income, it means that he's just hyper-focusing on being that billionaire patriarch and it destroys the marriage. So that's my main one. See it time and time again. I earn so much money, but my marriage is crap. Why? What have I got wrong? I... Well, hearing you read that made me sincerely wish that I could get the manuscript back that we just sent off for typesetting because I the, all the intro was normally I have a, been a very big, vast, important intro in my books, or at least leastways what I think is one. But this time it was just a checklist. Um, I wrote it at the end, like a proper introduction should be written at the end. And I think Nick, you were in the room, and I was just like, here are some some sim here's a symptom checker. Do you need this book? And I think I wound up with seven symptoms. I wish that were the eighth. Guys, <clears throat> are you saying I'm a great leader everywhere else, but <laughs> my wife doesn't follow me? Um, ninjas ain't shit. Bitches ain't shit, as they think in certain portions of the population. You're not a leader if just because like you you're a a Costco manager and you chant strawberries at the beginning of the day and everyone has to follow you or be fired and they're just embarrassed, you know, just put your hand in the middle. Strawberries are the product of the day. Dude, I'm such an <laughs> inspirational leader. All these guys that are like, people listen to me at work. You know, I, I, I just, I give them talks at work. You, you hold a paycheck, man. Like Ebenezer Scrooge did not inspire anyone. He didn't inspire Marley. Marley's the leader, Bob Marley. He has a family who loves him. Scrooge ain't shit. And, and the fact that Marley for eight hours a day or whatever it is, 11 hours a day has to do what Scrooge says. That's not because he's a leader. That's because he's got a leash and a collar. And, you know, he's, he's institutionally and economically uh, hard, hardwired to have to follow that. That's not a leader. You ain't shit if your wife doesn't listen to you. And your kids don't listen to you. And that'll that'll tap into some of mine. But I just want to say, I man, I wish I, I set this as the eighth symptom checker uh, because you're not a leader. You're like Robert the Bruce tells his leprous father at the end of Braveheart. You're not a man. Okay. So don't say, oh, well, I am 99% of the ways. But one, it's um, it's an all or none thing. Either your family follows you. That's really the only place a man can be a leader. We need to start telling that truth. Or you're not a leader at all. It, it, just because you're like the project lead at your group and we, we do marketing and everyone listens to my marketing ideas in the, the me meetings, that's stop lying to yourself. Your wife doesn't listen to you because you're not worth listening to at this point. You need to be a leader. And that's the check. Does your wife listen to you or not? Yeah. And the sad thing is right. that even your colleagues don't, you think they do, but they talk about you behind your back and they don't respect you either. So you can't get away from what Tim's just said, which is that 
your marriage is the main measure of your success as a married man. Like that's the most important area. And you can't borrow from other areas of your life and say, well, hold on, I am pretty masculine overall. If you look at all these things that are going so well, like when I go to the gym, guys high five me. Are you really <laughs> going to say that I'm not masculine? Tim, that was such deep Costco lore. I didn't know they had like products of the day that they all went to go sell. I feel like I, I, I had a friend, that. one of my close friends from the Dallas, ex close friends from the Dallas area worked at Sam's for like, you know, all throughout the band days. And he would tell us, he's like, I hate it so much. And he, literally the strawberry, they would have a product of the day. It was Sam's, Sam's glove. Okay. And they would put their hands in the middle. And like, you know, you know what I'm talking about. If anyone who's ever worked retail, it's the same shit. If you're like, yeah businessman guy i i watched oh, yeah. this um king of collectible show about ken golden and he's like a multimillionaire, and he he thinks he inspires his people he's um an old divorced jewish guy but he's yeah. uh actually he found a basketball card i went and found it where he's sitting in the front seat for this Knicks sixers game this is joe lmb 23 24 hoops and ken golden is right there i just found it he thinks he's mr inspirational he has like one kid He's an old Jewish divorced guy. And I'm like, dude, it's Scrooge and Marley, man. Marley's the hero. Like, he's one of my favorite characters in all literature. He's poor. Rich, rich is such nonsense. It doesn't make you a man. And most guys that pretty much 99.9% .9 of the guys that think it even contributes much are pathetic and are followed by no one and inspire no one and will um, end up doing nothing for nobody in the last analysis. Yeah, I was, as you guys are describing that, I was thinking of a, of the guy in the feudal system, you know, the father, and which is probably like my grandfather's great-grandfather in Hungary because they lived in the feudal system. I often think about this because I have the Stumphauser anthology going all the way back. And we were Catholics for, I, th I think, like a thousand years, maybe longer. It's been pretty cool to see that Roman Catholics in, in uh, Eastern Europe there. And I just imagine like my grandfather's great grandfather, like scything wheat or whatever, whatever he was doing on the the feudal lord's land. And just how completely dignified like his wife. Wouldn't be looking out there at him scything wheat and thinking. Gosh, if he was just. I don't I don't know, like. A, a knight or something or like wearing pantaloons instead, I would find him so much more attractive. Like that never crosses her mind. And when he comes into the house, presumably, I, I don't know the stories here, you know, his word is law. She respects him. Uh, Tim, when you were writing Leaving Cleave, you were finding some really fascinating, what was it? Papal commentary about just how respected the husband is, the father is in comparison to today you remember what i'm talking about yeah i think so i think that's in um ask uh, just the sources the the joint bibliography from um ask your husband in case for patriarchy yeah. you know we just stuck it in the back yeah yeah just absolutely. like the office being being so revered not saying that that's uh necessarily a given you know it of course in some ways it is but um to will to your point about the the giving a Lambo. I, I didn't know if you said that because you saw the same video that I did, but I watch, um, I love watching these YouTube shorts of this guy, Andy Elliott, who sells, he sells cars or he was a car salesman and then got, you know, hit escape velocity. And now he's the guy who tells car salesmen how to sell cars. You know, they hire him. And there's a video of him with his wife, who's like jacked, of course, because all of these like high performing guys all of these high performing guys have like butch wives it's very it's very strange there's something psychologically going on there and you know she's wearing like a cut off and she has like biceps and like a strong jawline and i think it was for valentine's day it was either valentine's day or her birthday he's like come outside and they offload a mclaren off the back of this semi truck and he's like, this is for you, baby. And in his videos, he's super, you know, he's bald, 
He's wearing like short shorts with his quads coming out. He's like, I'm just, I'm going to sell cars. He's so aggressive. And in this video with his wife, this man is terrified. As this car is coming off, he's like, here's, 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 here's your car, honey. And her first words are, I'm going to kill you. And then she like physically aggresses him, like not quite gives him a noogie, but like kind of like. So I just when you said, you know, buy, buy a Lamborghini, I'm thinking of this video where. And she's got they've got two kids. And she talks about how she like partitions like 15 minute segments or whatever to like spend time with her kids so she can like give it her all at the Andy Elliott school of selling cars or something like that. So yeah, billionaire patriarchy, absolute laughable joke, absolute laughable joke. And it's Tim, something that the red pill guys, um, I think encourage even a lot of Catholic men, Christian men to fall into because the messaging that, you know, real man has to earn at least six figures is so strong. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Tim, you mentioned uh, that it's not, you can't be 99% quote unquote of a man out in the world and then fail 1% in the home, that that's just complete nonsense that if your wife and kids don't respect you, uh, then you're not a man. But you also get more specific um, in Leave and Cleave with how your teenage kids view you, how their dispositions are with you as a patriarch and what that implies about you. What's a misconception that guys have about patriarchy with respect to teenage kids? Well, the boomers, uh, boomers operate on wasp wisdom and it's secularist. And so it didn't change much now that the wasps are kind of out of power and it's fully the secular left that runs things. There's, there's a bit of a sort of tonal shift. It's more haughtily secular, but Protestant wisdom, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant wisdom, which kind of governed American pop culture. The, the you know prior to the last forty years, it was the previous hundred years it was just waspisms, and boomers really operate on prosperity gospel, which is wasp. The idea that that all teens are like bad, which is wasp. The idea that working hard is really, really, really like important for Christians, which it's really not. Um, that it, it, that's a waspism, the idea that, um, there's something called work ethic. That's like, there's absolutely nothing Aristotelist about that. I mean, don't be a lay about you got to do something for a living, but no one, no one cares. Um, at least ways, no one in the Holy Trinity, how hard you work, as long as you're not sinning through sloth. So, and, and God's not like, well, you made 120 K instead of 70 K. So even though you were addicted to porn, I'm going to let you go to heaven. And this is not how it works. It's all wasp bullshit. And so as regards teens, um, the wasps turned secularist always had this lie that, that, that teen, like late teenagers, when they start to get really rebellious, I don't know, 16, 17, 18, 19, the, you know, teens are crazy. They do bad stuff. You know, all all of the 80s and 90s horror films are about them. They all did drugs. They all had sex, premarital sex. They all were like pretty much like anytime an adult's not around, they're like, this is our chance to be bad, which um, Bart Simpson intones. This is not how it is. Um, what they were doing is a defense mechanism. The, the boomer, the boomer adults of those years, 70s, 80s, 90s, with the slasher films. It was like projection. Teens hated them. Teens hate weak leaders. Teens, um, even the kind of dumb or, or truly morally mediocre ones, respond to strong leadership. What, you know, Will's talking about uh, a man's definition is a father in potency, a woman's definition is a mother in potency, but there are fundamental, um, what's called a proper accident that it goes with it every time. So it seems like an essential characteristic that goes with man and woman A man's leader to be active, to be expressive, to be the leader, to be active, to be expressive. A woman is to be a follower, the proper accidents and to be passive and to be receptive. See how they go together. And there's, there's proper ways to do each. <clears throat> well, in the seventies, eighties, nineties, early two thousands, when the wasp 
guys that just, they made a lot of money and they had their 1.8 kids per household. They spun the narrative, oh, well, teens are just bad. Even in the 60s, the, the 60s too, because it was greatest, greatest gen that first started spinning this. Greatest gen was more wasp than the boomers and, and they're really bad. So they, they were like, oh, our, our, my teens hate me because they just, you know, they have long hair. I have like the Johnny Unitas haircut you can set your watch to. And I work this much per week. Don't tell me I'm a bad man. Like, yeah, I have two divorces, but I work 50 hours a week. I did that for 75 years. I'm a good man. It's like, you're not though. That I mean, who, who the fuck told you that it's about work? Like, that's like the least important part of the vocation. It gets me hot. And it's just because of waspism and all that. So teens were always like teens that I guess were young uh, boomers. And then boomers onboarded it once they turned like 30. They just became the greatest, their greatest gen parents who they'd hated, whom they'd hated before. They're like, no, I, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like I don't mind the Johnny Unitas haircut. That's fine. But but the um the idea that this amoral proposition like work and not loving your family and working extra hard for a, a wrong reason anyway makes you a good person when you're a bad person. You're a weak leader as a man. You don't lead your household. You don't lead when you get home. You don't really care how your family does. You had 1.7 kids because you're a contraceptive um sterile family denying machine who just goes to work teens hate that and that is my explanation for the entire horror genre as as bad as it was from the 70s 80s and 90s all, all teens are bad the sheriff always hates teens. what's really interesting are movies with good teens in them if they if you uh, all of my favorite movie have good clever moral teens in them not because i, I it, you, you tend to gravitate toward characters that are your own age but i'm like I'm a psychology guy in the sense that I love movies that have clever, inspiring, moral, intellectual teens, or at least semi-intellectual teens that buck the trend. Because teens are really good. They have some weaknesses. They can be posers for one another, but they're really good at making um, incisive critiques of mediocre adults around them. They're naturally, they, they go their own way when they're outside of their age group. And the really good ones go their own way when they're inside their age group. And they are fundamentally honest, more honest than most adults. Their, their um, truth drive, uh, Bernard Lonergan calls it the pure de desire to know, hasn't been dulled by the constant lie telling that is called politeness in the boring, pathetic adult world. So <clears throat> in response, like the boomer and greatest gen over generation with respect to the seventies, then eighties, nineties hated them and just were like, all teens are, uh, you know, evil. And therefore they have Freddie or Jason or Michael Myers just going around plowing them down. And I would say this is a kind of repressed murder drive, a Kronos drive, right. To kill the people, the up and coming generation that's physically more virile than the men of the older generation. Like just get a, just get a serial murderer to kill them all. Cause they're having all this, cause they're an older, you go deep with the psychology because they're the older defunct swiftly moving toward obsolescence generation who um, is immoral themselves. Yeah. They have these kind of wasp values. Are those really even Christian at all? Eh, I don't know. And so they just want to be the the young the, the nineteen year old that's knocking down all the girls and and stuff because they haven't inculcated like virtue ethics. So they're just, it's just a Chronos thing. So have Michael Myers or Freddie or Jason do it. Um, teens are really can be really good. And my my myth is that in a household with good leadership, if your dad is Will Noland or Mike Pentile or, or myself, you have a great relationship with your teens. Your teens respect you a lot. It's easier for me to get along with, you know, my 13 or 16 year old now than, I mean, we never had a hard time getting along. I, I love little kids. I like playing with them, but it's easier to have, they want to go on errands, get into deep conversations. It's just the opposite of the movie dad, even you know, whether it's a liberal movie dad or conservative movie dad, you know, Paul Rudd on this end, or like, I don't know, Dana Carvey on the right wing end. 
they only play what they can relate to, which is, yeah, your teens stop wanting to hug you or go on errands with you one-on-one once they turn like 12 or 13 because they're embarrassed by you. Well, they're embarrassed by you because you're, you know, l- look at how you behave. You're not, you're not a man, Paul Rudd. You're not a man. I don't know. Ned Flanders guy on the right. Um, that's not true though. You connect with them more deeply because they're taking big, big steps toward true morality and true intellectuality as they turn 13, 14, 15. And, um, you'll be able to, if if you're a real man, you'll be able to connect with them much deeper. I, I haven't even talked to Will about this, but it's like, I I'm sure that's how it's been for him. You, you can actually show that you're right about stuff by explaining things in more depth than their peer group can or secular teachers can. And even if they might not see that you're as right as you really are at first, when they actually experience it and figure it out and watch what's happening to their own friends, they're like, oh, that's what dad said. And I can see it's happening. And he told me about that already. And now I really get it. So especially regarding teenage girls and sexual morality and what boys are like most of the time and what they can see unfolding around them and in reality TV shows as well and what the culture is demanding of them. That's an area where I think for fathers and daughters, especially there are some really good conversations to be had while acknowledging that the mother is always going to have the biggest impact on the sexual morality of daughters. But the father can achieve a lot just through having a great marriage as well. They can actually see how he treats his wife. They learn from that. But being the moral protector there comes back to what we said about the billionaire, billionaire patriarch not being enough. The The main focus shouldn't just be bringing in money. I would imagine, as a, especially as a father, I'm not sure about motherhood, uh, what that's like. I'm curious what your guys' wives have been looking forward to the most. But I would imagine as a dad, I know for me, the teenage years of my future sons excite me more than the younger years for those exact reasons is it's like, I still kind of feel like a teenager. Um, Tim, it sort of sounded like you were intoning that, like you resonate with these clever young teens because of the youthful spirit and sort of the rebellious spirit. It's like, well, none of us have really lost that, but we have, you know, wisdom on our side, experience on our side. <clears throat> You know, we screwed up a lot, so we know how to transpose that under our kids and say, hey, don't do not do what I did. But that would excite me the most, and I feel like it would be just such a dagger to the heart if it, – it should be a dagger to the heart if you hit 13, 14, 15 with your kids and at every opportunity they're just trying to dodge you. Like, you screwed up. You did something very wrong if they don't look to you at that age as like – man, I got time with dad. Like this guy knows right. everything. He's fun. Like he he treats me like an adult. He sees through my bullshit. He's always on my team. He's advocating for me. He's not like dodging the important conversations of stuff. I don't feel like I have to hide things from him. Like how do I talk to girls or like how do I avoid lust or what, what about this business idea that I have? Like if he's always there with you, that should be, you know, maybe not the best friendship because that's marriage, but the second best friendship, a friendship of unequals. And that should just be electrifying as a, as a father. Yeah. And it contradicts the experience of 99% of the men out there. And there's a good reason for that. Cause they don't know how to do patriarchy, which is why we wrote leave and cleave. I think it's the best tell of all of them. I think it's the best. I, I wish I'd stuck that, that one that will mentioned in there as the eighth premise. Yeah. You know, pr- symptomology but i think this is the best one how do your teens regard you men mm. you're your wife because they also picked it up from your wife smart teens tend to reason a little bit like smart wives ir- irrespective of age the teens because there's a little bit of that natural rebellion that we associate with eve but um the natural rebellion properly ordered and, and good kind of energy it's kind of feminine energy to always be in a state of rebellion, but like with a smart wife, smart teens, they're directing it at the right stuff. They're making fun of the the druggy kids in the bathroom. They're making fun of the the losers who are um abu- who abuse themselves. This is so pathetic, or who are having premarital sex. And that 
if they understand the angles, they don't miss a trick and they know what to orient their righteous mockery at. Yeah, well, I think every adult man wishes he could take his experience, his wisdom, and become a teen again. And every teen, theoretically, should be looking up to an adult man if he was cool enough. And yeah. saying like, man, I I wish I could embody these things that I'm obviously lacking. This, you know, this wisdom, this fearlessness in the face of conflict, whatever it is. So yeah, that that is a really great, great tell. Good misconception. Will, you have one here called the <laughs> imaginary lat syndrome patriarchy. That's it. You know that meme about guys who go to the gym and they make a little oh. bit of progress. And then hang they on, hang on. We should call the other one Stephen King patriarchy. <laughs> Tim yeah. for the for the yeah. hatred of teens. Sorry, yes. Yeah. So guys go to the gym. A little bit of progress and then walk around with their arms way out to yeah. make room for their enormous imaginary lats and they swagger down the street and everyone yeah. has to just make way. Here I come. Like I'm Ronnie Coleman. Can't you see? Um, so imaginary lat syndrome patriarchy is like the insecure guy's version of what he imagines a patriarch is. And it normally comes out as a brittle kind of tyranny where because the insecurity is pretty deep, um, everything is perceived as some kind of disrespect and he can't ever have enough control. And because his ego is so big in his vision of himself as a patriarchy, it's just like the guy who walks around with the imaginary lats and there's like never enough room. He's always bumping into stuff. And it makes it very difficult for him to have any kind of good relationship with his wife or with kids, especially as they get older, because everything is some kind of slight to his pride. And that, I think, is one of the ways in which guys who learn a little bit about some of the true things that the Red Pill has to say about the dangers of simping, etc., get things wrong. And they try to apply it to their own marriages. But it's a bit like a heresy in the area of faith and morals, because like the church fathers said, error grows best in the shade of truth. So imaginary lat syndrome patriarchy, there's some truth to it in that most guys actually aren't masculine enough and they do need to assert themselves more and have more presence. But the red pill or the imaginary lat syndrome patriarchy takes that way, way out of proportion and becomes a dangerous thing. And I've worked with guys who have pushed their marriages to breaking point because of that. Like, I'm I'm so cold. I'm never going to simp. You can't mess with me. There's zero disrespect in this household. I'm going to hold this line as hard as possible when it's my way or the highway. And it goes really badly wrong. It sounds kind of like what you said before, where if you have to tell your wife to make you a sandwich, you're not a patriarch. If you have to tell your wife, I'm a patriarch, you're not a patriarch. Like if you're trying to defend this very fragile vase that is your patriarchy and like, hey, 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 five feet, five, you got to stay away from the patriarchy. It's five feet. All right. Don't you see the stanchions here? No pictures, no pictures. This is my patriarchy. Then you're not a patriarch. Is that is that kind of what you're saying? Yeah. And you most people if they've been through school system, like I can remember as a teenager, especially the teachers that people respected, they just walk into the room and everyone was silent. They wouldn't have to shout to get attention. They wouldn't make a fuss. They didn't have like a megaphone or a whistle. And there were headmasters who could just walk into a room and 1,500 kids, you could hear a pin drop because everyone was understanding in that moment, like this guy's the leader. And then you get weaker ones and they can't hold a crowd. No one cares what they have to say. And they have to give like the throat clearing. Ahem, ahem. Like, don't you know someone's important here? It's time for everyone to pay attention to me. They're like begging for attention and trying to announce the title. So that's why I think people make a big show and dance of being patriarchs sometimes because otherwise no one's going to notice. Tim, imaginary lat patriarchy. Any any thoughts about the if you have to say it, it's not real. If you have to defend it, then you're just not a man. Well, I think he, he said it really well. There's 
Um, yeah, it's not LARPing. I guess that's probably the main thought that'll come through <clears throat> is just that this is what, what's real doesn't need to be LARPed at. Same as kind of like, <clears throat> it's not LARPing in the case of new lovers, but just like PDAs and stuff. Everyone's kind of like, oh, um, it's kind of like a guy that's LARPing as a patriarch. Everyone's like, oh, you know, and there, there may be different motivations, but the, the authentic article, the genuine article is what it is. And it's not overbearing. And it's not in everybody's face. The genuine article is like, it is what it is, it, you know, sort of um, understated and, but absolutely efficacious as an ex as an instance uh, of of its species and genus that's what it is to be a patriarch it doesn't mean you never laugh it doesn't mean you're constipated all the time it doesn't mean you don't we'll get to you know my last um example in a second it doesn't mean you don't listen to anybody I mean, that's the crappiest model of leadership i can imagine you know not listening to good counsel it just means it just means that when you give a direct order people snap to attention um it doesn't mean you do so intentionally seldom. It just means that it is sort of by its quantitative essence relatively seldom. I mean, I just, I don't have that many orders to give every day. I, I can't, um, you know, in terms of deciding when we eat or what we eat, or even if we're going to a restaurant, you know, half the time, Steph and I, if we are going to go to a restaurant, we let the kids, we'll, we'll at least pull the kids. Um, boomers never did that. I'm like, that doesn't matter. That has nothing to do with my leadership. I don't really care. You know, if it's, if it's, as long as it's not spoiling the children, half the time we're like, let, let them at least give them the illusion of deciding. Um, the only thing they can't decide are the morals, which are the, the bedrock principles of the home. So the, all of this is sort of, of a piece. There's a unifying theme here. It's, um, true control involves a, Quidditative parsimony, which is to say you hold the reins over everything that's important in the home if you're the real leader, if you're a real man. It's just that simple. And, and that, that involves a few decisions a day, maybe two or three. Everything else, I think most most guys that are intellectually and emotionally secure are are deferring on. And then finally, uh, maybe it's four or five, maybe it's four or five. I don't know. I haven't counted, but it's just not that much control you're exercising daily. Yeah. I don't know. I haven't really seen you have to give that many orders. It's mostly just like fielding requests for beverages. <laughs> can, <laughs> can, can I have this? Can, what about this? Can I have, can I have this? Um, yeah. And you alluded to it, but, but number five, I don't know what, pithy name we can come up with on the spot but uh does a patriarch never ask for advice and he only talks to himself and everybody else is stupid and an idiot autism or pa he... autism patriarchy autism patriarchy. what do you say what'd you say well autism o autism patriarchy, patriarchy. <laughs> yeah yeah um, or, or maybe asperger's patriarchy well which one's the one yeah. depends how bad it is yeah, <laughs> yeah right. so um there's a historical example that i really like and it i think it shows really clearly why um even the kind of guys that people use as what they imagine would have been examples of people who you know never took advice from their wives like the great kings and warriors of the past they're actually some of the best examples of men who did like their wives were their most trusted counselors so yeah. i've just looked up here i like this is my favorite one um Saint Margaret was the granddaughter of an English king and became the bride of Malcolm in 1070, then reigned as Queen of Scotland until she died in 1093. Uh, she was renowned for how well she educated her eight children, and her prudence and zeal also meant she was her husband's most trusted counsellor. So whether it was dealing with um, political opponents, whether it was to do with battles as well, whatever it was he had going on in his life, he would always go and seek her advice first because he thought that she was the wisest. 
And this is a guy who could have just said whatever he wanted to have done, clicked his fingers and made it happen, right? But he always wanted to go and check what she thought first. So the most alpha guy you can imagine, a literal king, went to his wife and said, hey, what do you think about this course of action? Because he cared what she had to say, because he thought she was pure of heart, prudent, all the rest of it. And it would be dumb for him not to go and check with her. Not that he was asking for permission, right? No. But that he was just asking for counsel and input because it's prudent of him to actually see what another smart person thinks because maybe, just maybe, she has a good idea. Also, in the tragedy of Caesar by Shakespeare, he didn't listen to his wife, Cassandra. They're like, don't go, beware of the Ides of March. And he he doesn't listen and he gets stabbed by Brutus and Cassius and all the senators. Also, Pilate. Uh, mm -hmm. his wife, uh, Claudia, mm -hmm. uh, according to holy tradition, who was being, um, absolutely strongly, not, not admonished. Cause that's for the leader alone, but, but given the council, Hey, this Jesus of Nazareth is a holy man. Let him go. We don't want the trouble. And then he's being like a, a utilitarian douche. And he's like, well, yeah, but I, I'll get in trouble with Caesar if there's another Jewish uprising. And she's like, who cares? You'll have bigger problem. And he's like, no. And he kind of tries to navigate a middle way. No, I mean, what? Yeah, it, I guess the essence of the fallacy that goes against the 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 autism, or that, that then forms the autism patriarchy model is that you're given this um, one bite of the apple counselor meaning a counselor you know you're given a war council and a peace council both you can't listen to them both um and this is, could be maybe your wife and your eldest teen if you're if you submit it to them should have smart teens you know hey what do you guys think of this you know you don't have to do it with that you don't have to do it with anything but um there will be decisions that you're not sure about the, the best decisions sometimes are 51 49 preponderance not everything's a 99 one and um you're a moron if you don't pull the people you're given in your immediate vicinity on 51 49 decisions the winning decision is 51 49 your eyes can't spot that that um degree of minutiae of of disparity between uh right and wrong good and evil so yeah, it's it's uh you know you have a, a, a war council and a peace council. Make your best case. You make your best case. That's when you get really um good decisions. You know that famously, I, I took a class with Joe Bassett on this at Claremont. Ed Fazer's um, co-author on the famous now famous death penalty book on um, the deliberate sense of the Senate. That was all it was. What is it to be a deliberative body? The House of Representatives is not meant to be deliberative. The Senate is. And the paradigm instance was the dichotomy between um, Cuban Missile Crisis and Bay of Pigs. One with a good outcome, one with a bad outcome. It was a deliberative process. Well, a good leader knows how to lead, lead most of the time unilaterally. But um, the rest of the time, if he if he does have to pull his, his closest counselor or counselors, how to lead the deliberative process or how to make the process deliberative. Maybe he'll be truly kind of the observer, but you got to set the conditions for the possibility of deliberation. And there are some elements to deliberation I learned in Bissett's class. Really, really important stuff because um, another thing insecure guys do when they're beginning, they, they maybe heard the red pill stuff or maybe some of our stuff or some of the, there are many CMS copycats out there in the last year. Uh, I see him on Twitter alone. There's just lots of Christian patriarchy copycats now because we we kind of made the mold. Uh, and so they know at least to pretend to be the leader. So they're just never going to pull the electorate. It's like, well, that's a kind of insecure rule that can never ask people, well, where do you want to go to dinner? Or not even that. That was more my last example. This is more like, hey, I really don't know. This seems to be a really close case. What do you, what do you guys think? Sometimes it's not even the teens. Sometimes I'll ask my 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 twin nine-year-olds because they're smart too you know in, in in iq is not something that is unique to a cultivated intellect if you have smart kids you know someone will go ask Pitt or charlie you know the nine-year-olds hey what do you think of this i mean if it's really close it's kind of like <clears throat> hanging pictures 
you know, and you're like, I, I don't have a level nearby. It, does this look even to you guys? I don't know. I think, I think real, <clears throat> real patriarchs do that when there's a legit question. Now you're not doing it to mollify or pacify wife and or teens to make them feel important. Everyone that's again, that's stuff kind of that, that the, that the cucks do. I just mean when you're legitimately not sure, pull the smart people in your immediate vicinity. And this begins with your counselor, She's called a help meet because she was given to you partly for counsel. The important thing there is the one by the apple rule where you have to, a wife has to know, I'm going to ask you what you think. I might do the exact opposite after carefully considering what you offered. And there's no, no tantrum, no even silent um, protest. Just give your opinion. Sometimes I'll, I'll take it. Sometimes I won't because sometimes I'm really close and you might not push me over to your point of view. And that's another good test, actually, if if you seek counsel, <clears throat> but ultimately you take a different course of action. She owes you what the catechism of Trent calls a willing and ready obedience. So, you you know, you've asked her opinion and you still decide otherwise and you go with the course of action that she didn't recommend. She still has to give you willing and ready obedience to that. If she does throw a tantrum, gives you the silent treatment, tries to blame and shame you into apologizing, etc., that's a good sign that you have a feminist marriage. Like you're living within the feminist framework of actually she told you her opinion and you were supposed to obey. And now she's upset because you didn't. Yeah. And if you have to inform her of the catechism of Trent after she throws a tantrum that, honey, you're supposed to be giving me willing and ready obedience please see imaginary lat syndrome patriarchy because you shouldn't have to say that either. Yeah. Although sadly the formation of so many women is so bad. The feminism is there on an intellectual level that you do have to do some of the educating sometime because they might sure. say, but I've been yeah. told, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. mutual submission and they get all technical. Yeah. Not everything's a symptomology. I mean, sometimes a really good man is on a less strong leadership day. I, it's, it should be few and far between instances, but sometimes a really good help me woman is on just a, you know, once, once twice a year kind of bad day. Sometimes a good teen is just going to be grouchy, but it, again, it shouldn't be every day. They might be unduly rebellious uh, a couple times a year. I mean, you don't want to turn everything into a symptomology, but if you if you try the any of these is shit tests and you're zero for three, that's a good sign that that it is a symptomology or what. However, however that um, should be expressed grammatically. Yeah, the um, it's making me think that point about men and women being complementary. If you look at some of the stuff that men are good at and that women are good at. You see it meshes together really well. So if a, a guy isn't actually using the stuff that his wife is good at for the benefit of the family, everybody suffers, including the man. Like there's some really interesting stuff showing that women are better on average at simple mathematical computation than men are, just like adding and subtracting. When it comes to reasoning and more complex stuff like algebra as well, spatial rotation, men are outperforming women. But like a simple household budget, just keeping track of ins and outs. Like women tend to be better at that kind of thing. So if you're a guy who's focused on work all the time and you want some help with the finances, you want your wife to help keep track of expenses, she'll probably be pretty good at it. Why not get her help? Well, Steph and Rachel consult with the matchmaking and Steph co-authored Leave and Cleave and wrote Ask Your Husband. So if you guys... Uh, didn't believe in what you're saying, then none of those things would be true. Um, as sort of a, a bonus round, uh, a rapid fire here, I'm very curious. You guys are pretty pretty close in age, um, same number of kids in roughly the same years of marriage. Um, I'm very curious if there was something about being a husband or father, either or, that you thought was going to be one way and ended up being another. And this doesn't have to be moral or prudential or anything. It could literally just be like, I, I didn't realize how great this was going to be, or I didn't realize how hard this was going to be. Um, just super curious if you guys have any of those things that surprised you about uh, becoming a, a patriarch. Probably the big one is 
not understanding the extent to which your wife is your best friend is a thing. Like just watching male friends come and go over the years and yeah. seeing your wife always being there is something I've just grown to appreciate the longer I've been yeah. married. Whereas yeah. as a young guy, late teen as well, the bros before hoes idea that you hear parroted around, I think all young men absorb a bit of that and it takes you a while to grow out of it. Yeah. I agree with that. One. I agree with that one. Cause I had very close friendships growing up through from like before middle school, like fifth grade through college. I had the same group of guys and that's kind of Steph ended up being part of that group later on of friends and, you know, really being kind of disowned when I, when I reverted to Catholicism by the group of friends and then seeing the, the vicissitudes of, of different male friend groups, since you know i got married since my young 20s adult friends it's just like wow there's one constant here from my childhood you know i've known steph since she was a teen i just turned 20 and just like wow this is real you know the the um the staying power of her so i'm, I'm strongly with you there my greatest surprise about not husbandry because that's farming but being a husband and being a father <laughs> i don't know anything about husbandry uh, being a husband and being a father, <laughs> adulthood, you know, the, the, the primary adult vocation, but it's adulthood, is <clears throat> a kind of moral disappointment. Adults are babyish big kids. It's just middle school dressed in moral garb the more I get to know more and more adults. Not that I'm getting to know more better, but just the more I pull. And even within myself, I have the same kind of hopes, same motivations, same fears as middle school, my strengths and weaknesses are pretty much the same. I've cultivated um, strengths a lot more. I've worked on the weaknesses um, somewhat more, but people are pretty much the same in adulthood as a kid. And I really didn't think that as a kid, my because I have very responsible parents. I, I thought pretty much all adults had their shit together and most of them don't. And even though I make sure, you know, and will make sure and Mike and Nick, that as adults, we're tending to everything we need to tend to. Um, you know that even on a good day, particularly it's your job. When I used to have a job, landman or a, a, you know, a lawyer or teacher, you're kind of like, I feel like I faked it till I make it like 50% of the time at a job. I feel less like that in the vocation because it's more natural, but pretty much all jobs, you're like, I'm kind of faking it till I make it. Yeah, I do figure stuff out veritably, but um. I would just say adulthood's kind of surprising. It's not a real distinction of kind um, as compared to childhood and adolescence. They're not, they're just it's a distinction of degree. That's it. You know that I've forgotten his name. There was a French priest who was in his like late eighties or early nineties or something, and someone asked him like, "What have you learned from six decades of confession?" Something like that, and he just said, "There are no adults." <laughs> I got to find his name, but they, he, like, no, there oh, are no wow. adults. Oh, you have um, to share that with me. That's a pretty face, isn't it? I got to find out his name. Um, yeah, let's just I look agree. it up. That's I agree. Cool. They just maybe aren't. The, maybe the priest was uh, the early 2000s band Bowling for Soup with their headliner song, High School Never Ends, <laughs> which is basically <laughs> the lyrics are all of what you guys just said. We used to play out with that band in um, Dallas. Or, or, oh, that's or, or. that's very cool. I'm a big fan of of them and of Sherburn. Um, hmm. <laughs> yeah, didn't expect either of those answers. Really titillating answers from both of you guys. The best friendship and that adults are mostly just big kids across the board. And Tim, I can resonate with you on on that one because we we do try to engage with allegedly adults yeah <laughs> allegedly yeah. we're trying to engage with adults as much as humanly possible and um they seem to be few and far between uh, in fact i've I've rarely met one honestly. well just in terms of the communication habits that's the dead giveaway right there hey we're trying to sell these documentaries we're trying to do big things i don't know how our, our mutual friend patrick coffin does it because he is the best the best in the business at reaching out 
until he gets a result from people. That's how he's interviewed Tucker and Jordan Peterson and just everyone. Everyone he wants, he gets as an interviewee. But I'm like, dude, how do you, I just get so exhausted. I, I am not a badgerer guy. I'm not a salesman guy. So I, I, I feel mawkish even saying, hey, like and subscribe to this video or whatever. Right. And right. Patrick isn't really either. He just is like, yeah, because I'm like, they're so, people are so babyish about responding to you. Even if you're like a relatively important guy, like a Patrick Coffin, they, they just, you know, and they're like, hey, we're interested in this. We, we might buy your documentary from you. You're like, cool. When can I hear from you? Next Monday latest. Cool. Next Monday comes around nine times out of 10, or maybe eight times out of 10. You have to, it doesn't matter how professional, half billion dollar this or that, you have to remind them. And you're like, I just didn't think that's how business was done, that, that there are no adults, even in business, especially in business. In a way, though, it shouldn't surprise us because of the the four wounds of original sin in right. human nature. Like it's right. there. You don't grow out of it. Right. 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 Yeah. That's it's. I guess it's just shocking that there's like two buckets, like saints and then a bunch of adolescent, arrested, uh, adolescents, yeah. arrested development. It's crazy that that's basically one of those two but things. The irony is Nick, that the, the, the saints, when you look at the way they talk about themselves towards the end of their lives, they're the ones who are most conscious of needing their hands held like metaphorically by the, by the grace yeah. of God. Like, otherwise I'm going to stumble like a toddler, hold my yeah. hand as I walk. Yeah. Confessions. Yeah. Uh, I'm not even that far into confessions, but St. Augustine, but the, the few chapters that I have listened to so far, it's that writ large. He's yeah. he's like I'm I'm an absolute child. I didn't. I still don't. He talks. He talks like he's a complete idiot, which is sort of an interesting paradox of the spiritual life. Which it's it's sort of um, frustrating or exasperating when you hear like these really holy people hand ring and tell you how not holy they are and how worthless they are and you're like okay well then what does that make us and it's like well apparently it makes you a piece of shit it's what it is and you have to be better i guess i guess i guess that's the answer according to the saints well i'm, um, I'm because we need humility to be able to grow spiritually and marriage is most men's vocation patriarchy is also the way that most guys are going to learn humility because it's hard yeah that's an interesting why is that because you were brought face to face with your limitations on a uh, daily basis in a way it. that humbles yeah. you ultimately that's it because dealing with the complexities of large family life on all levels is difficult and you realize you get things wrong often you have to say sorry etc cetera, etc cetera. and you might have an idea of yourself in your mind um and perhaps it's something as a single guy you got from reading about patriarchy on Twitter, right? And then it starts and you're thinking, oh, this is harder than I thought. Mm. <laughs> yeah, theory versus practice. Mm -hmm. As John C. Riley says in Step Brothers, you know, he says, I'm I'm so not a rape. I'm not a I'm so not a, a prick corrector guy, but this is only because it's a Catholic Protestant thing, Nick. And I, I said the same thing to Milo when he was on my show. I would never do this unless it were the second greatest intellectual saint. Everyone say it with me. It's St. Augustine. Only Protestants call him St. Augustine. Oh, really? St. <laughs> Augustine. And Augustine. even Milo, he's a mutual whatever. Nick, you know Milo better than I do. Even Milo was like, okay, okay, you're right. You're right. Like, <laughs> there's no such thing as St. Augustine. There's, like there's just revelation. There's literacy. And there's illiteracy. There's Catholicism, <laughs> literacy. Uh, yeah, it's August because the term is August. We say August, but um, you know right. we're talking August, about the August, of the heavens. Yeah, yeah, the Augustan Majesty of of you know Julius Caesar or something. It's and, and yeah, so it's a it's a Catholic Protestant thing. I, I'm sorry to do that. I, I hate no no correctors, but we have to go Saint Augustine They're fraternal for, corrections. This is important. Yeah. I, I never I never want to be considered Protestant. Isn't that also here's the revelations I, I, when they yeah, pluralize yeah, revelations. revelations? It's revelation. If there's only one, there's only one. There's just one vision gang. And that's another Protestant thing. Like I was reading the book of revelations, like 
You mean the books of Revelations? And how, when was there more than one? No, uh, last point, fraternal corrections are also out of control. Right after I did one, that, you could be in a, like a Catholic text group and like you make a joke and like you'll get contacted by four of the 20 guys. Like, that joke was really, do you think it was charitable? Like, uh, like it doesn't matter how banal the joke was. I mean, you know, maybe it wasn't so banal, but um dorky sort of Flanders Catholics are out of control with the fraternal correction. The only ones you ought to be making are, are Augustine, Augustine corrections or, or revelation revelations. I fraternal correction. Yeah. If your buddy's like doing something that's going to endanger his real spiritual health, but, but um, serious minded Catholics become Flanders who see, you know, mortal danger every in every situation. And it's like, usually jokes aren't mortal sins, even if they're kind of body. Of course, you're referring to Ned. I'm the referring Simpsons. to Ned. Yes. The, yeah, Ned, not not Timothy Flanders. People out there. Yeah. But Tim, when does Leave and Cleave hit the shelves? In Barnes hits, and Nobles is where near you. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it, it's so September 11 is the what we're calling the pub date. Um, you'll probably get it before then because it's being printed now, and they're many, many pre-orders on this thing. We we're pleased with how many pre-orders people go pre-order on timothyjgordon.com. Also pre-order the class. There still are seats in the class. It's the textbook for the class. You don't need the class or the book or the book for the class, but um, you know, both of them go out, publish September the 11th. The class is called One Flesh. The book for the class is called Leave and Cleave. It's my fifth book, Steph's second. And um, we found out after the fact that those are from the same uh, verse in scripture. Uh, oh, in Genesis two. So that was really cool because that was just uh, we called it one flesh, and then we said leave and cleave, and they're from you know they're they're separated by a semicolon in Genesis chapter two. Hmm. Wow, two. are you going to pay royalties to the author of scripture? I will. Does he, get a, does he get a check every month? I do so via prayer and fasting, though. Like, hold on, let me get my calculator and figure out how much I have to pray and fast. <laughs> That's On the Amazon. Jewish, that's the Old Testament way of doing it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you were pulling from the Old Testament. I figured the laws apply. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it's, they should. On Amazon, if you look up the Douay Reims Bible, the author, it just has God, which I really like. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Will, if someone's uh, marriage is in disrepair, if it is in the death throes, how do they get saved? Um, by your wizened help. Well, I don't know about that. I don't think I save any marriages. I can just help put some extra pressure on guys so that God can save the marriages. But you can go to school.com and look up the free group there for guys who are interested in this kind of thing, the Patriarchy Project. You can also just type that into your Google Patriarchy Project. Completely free. Sign up, apply. We might let you in depending on if we think you're a good fit or not. And then you'll be with some like-minded guys who are all focused on learning more about this, which I think is the most important thing that a married man can do with his life. This is the area where you want to excel. So that's what it's there for. Excellent. And uh, follow Mike Pantile on Twitter. Um, he's got a uh, masculinity coaching group thing that he just opened up as well. Follow him on Instagram and Twitter. Follow Will on Twitter, be her leader at be her leader. Follow Timotheology on Twitter. And uh, stay tuned for news about what a woman is. And see you guys next Friday for another episode of CMAX. This was really fun. Thanks, guys, so much. Great one. Take care, guys.